Hello and welcome to Tank and AFV News. My name's Tom and today we're doing yet another book review. Today we're looking at Professor Porsche's Wars by Carl Ludwigsen. Probably killed that on the pronunciation, but that's what it looks like to me. Anyhow, this um, book was sent to me by the fine folks at Pen and Sword Publishing. Um, been very kind, sent me quite a few copies. Usually they'll send me a list of like anything that's got like sort of tank in the title. Um, this one actually I saw in their catalog and said, hey, can you send me this one too? Because it looks interesting, and they did. So I do appreciate that. Um, and it is an interesting book, and partly because it's looking at the career of Professor Porsche rather than specifically about tanks. I mean, obviously most of the books I look at are um, specifically about tanks. This is obviously ties in quite closely. Dr. Porsche was very involved in tank design uh, during World War II with Germany. Um, oddly enough, for being one of their most famous designers, I mean, if you go around and say, you know, to anybody who's interested in the field, name name a German tank designer, probably Porsche is one that'll come off the top of your head. Partly because you know he was sort of out there promoting um, himself, and you know his, his his name is known to this day, sort of in a different context with the sports cars. That said, he wasn't a particularly successful tank designer. If you look at did his vehicles actually get into production? Um, and most of the vehicles he's most well known for didn't. Um, you know, he had his whole series of uh, Tiger Tank versions uh, that none of them got accepted. He kept getting beat by Henschel. He had the Mouse, of which all of two were built. And, uh, you know, he had the, the what was named after him, the Ferdinand, which later became the Elephant, which was an outgrowth of his Tiger Tank designs. You know, but uh, like there were, what, 90-some uh, of, of those built. And, you know, it's sort of interesting, all those, what all those had in, in common was his sort of fixation with a diesel electric drive system, which just didn't turn out to be particularly practical for the Germans at that stage in the war. It's a very interesting system, um, and it did have quite a few benefits, which was part of the reason why he found it appealing. But, uh, you know, Germany in that situation, when, when copper is a strategic material and is in short supply, uh, you know, tanks that require huge sort of generators with a lot of copper in them are not the best idea and the German army saw that and said no thank you Dr. Porsche. Anyhow the book itself so it's it's quite night large uh, I think this was originally released in hardcover this is the soft cover version and you know it's interesting when I saw the description I didn't read it super close the details and I assumed it would be um, sort of a text-based book it is actually quite heavily um, not illustrated they're not illustrations but photographs so lots of photographs which is very nice because in a book like this where you're talking about you know somebody who's an engineer working on all these different things it, you you really have to see them to understand what they're talking about um particularly since some of porsche's designs were a little unconventional or um complex uh so for example and you know there's a whole paragraph in here trying to describe the the torsion bar suspension system of, of the ferdinand tank destroyer you know and you just sort of have to see a picture of it to imagine what it is, although even sometimes when you see the pictures, it, they're a little M.C. Escher-esque, trying to figure out exactly how that thing worked. I've, I've never quite understood the point. Anyhow, uh, the book itself, I'm not going to do sort of a blow-by-blow -blow description, because there's so many different projects and vehicles he worked on um, that it's really, you really couldn't do it. You just need to buy the book itself and read it, and a lot of the stuff doesn't pertain to tanks specifically. So we'll just say it starts off with sort of the beginning of his career at sort of the turn of the century, um, obviously he's a name that's most associated with car racing, but he, and here you can see early pictures of, of early 19th century autos, uh, going through, but he's involved in all sorts of different things. I mean, here's, this is a really fantastic armored car design. I mean, look at the size of those wheels. It's just crazy. Um, so he's involved with stuff during World War One. Um, and I'll just sort of skip through it quickly. Lots of different things that will be of interest to people, especially if they like World War One technology. Uh, although not specifically tank stuff. I mean, obviously Germans didn't really do a lot of tank development during World War I. It was pretty limited. Um, after the war, he gets involved. So let's skip ahead. And like lots of nice pictures of engines, um, which is nice because you don't always find those in books. Um, he does in the 20s get involved. So here we go with the uh, Gross Tractor. So there you can see a picture, some more. So the description of that and his roles, you know, here you can see the sort of the suspension system that they had at that time, which is very similar to what's, as they point out here, to the six-ton Vickers tank. So you can sort of see, sort of, uh, almost what you could say is, 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 is uh, 
parallel evolution and suspension systems amongst different countries. Um, then kind of skip along to uh, World War II. So there's some of the car racing stuff, but here we get to the Third Reich. Um, and so that early experience with the gross tractors would sort of give him a little leg up. He understood the tank design business a little bit. Um, however, sort of, you know, within his Third Reich career, probably his busiest, biggest success is, of course, the Volkswagen Beetle. Um, and I'm not really a car expert by any stretch, um, and people do like cars. It is interesting, though, the Beetle, you know, it, it's worth pointing out that this car that would become the symbol of sort of the 60s to a certain extent and, and the love and peace generation, um, you know, growing up, we I had, you know, Herbie the Love Bug, which is sort of a live action Disney thing. And yet this car started off as an attempt to make an affordable car for the citizens of the Third Reich. I mean, here we have a picture of Hitler in the back seat. I, you know, I'm pretty sure most people that drive Volkswagen Beetles um, don't really like to think of Hitler being in the back seat. That's sort of not the image that Volkswagen certainly wants to promote these days. And it's just an interesting example of how these pieces of technology, that, you know, the technology itself is just a thing. It's just a design. Uh, and yet we assign so many different um, characteristics to it, uh, whether they be uh, negative or positive. It's just a thing, you know, but yet they become symbols and those symbols can change due to really effective marketing. You know, so whether it's, you know, Marlboro cigarettes went from being a, a women's cigarette brand to being, you know, the, the ultra macho Marlboro man brand. Or, you know, the Volkswagen Beetle, which went from Hitler's people's car to, you know, the summer of love car. So, sorry, a little tangent there. Back to when I was doing media literacy instructions. So, anyway, onward with the book review. Um, as you go forward, it gets into more military stuff. Let's jump ahead a little bit. Uh, Kubelwagen, of course, and the Swimmenwagen. Interesting stuff in here, um, especially talks about some of the Allied testing of this vehicle after the war, and uh, they seem quite enamored with it. Um, I will say the author uh, does like to point out positive things about Porsche, um, his, his, his engineering skill and his designs. Probably, you could say the author is a little biased toward his subject. Um, or sort of impressed by his subject. Um, and obviously Porsche is a very talented uh, designer and a very capable person. But I would say, you know, I, I did pick up a little bit of that where he's a little bit, I don't want to say in love with the subject, but certainly sort of side with him a little bit, particularly when he talks about sort of the, the, the squabbles between the different Third Reich uh, personalities and power, being Porsche and Sphere, which obviously there was some... There, there was some um, Disagreement with, between those two, um, and since Spear was Minister of Armaments and, and Porsche's a armament maker, designer, that obviously they're going to have some potential conflicts there. Uh, here we get into what for I think tank fans will be the most interesting part of the book, um, and probably some of the most familiar, talking about the Porsche Tigers. Uh, not there, it's pretty interesting reading, pretty good stuff. There was a couple small errors I noticed. Um, nothing terribly dramatic, but there was a, um, one photo in here of Spear actually driving one of the Henschel VK, sort of this one here, it calls this the, the Henschel Tiger Hull, it's, it's actually one of the earlier, uh, VK, I forgot the exact designation, I'm sure everybody who plays World of Tanks remembers it, but anyway, you know, minor thing, um, and a few other little things jumped out at me as maybe, like, not absolutely correct or phrased a little oddly, but for the most part, it seems like pretty well researched uh, stuff. And there, you know, some interesting observations in here. Now, one thing I thought was interesting was they talk, um, like I said, quite a bit about engines in this book, which is nice because that sort of gets overlooked when people think about tank design. You know, the focus tends to be on armor and guns because those are sort of the things that. Uh, People like to fixate over, you know, and, you know, in large part, that's not really the hard thing for somebody who has to design a tank. Uh, the gun's usually designed by somebody else, you know, your gun designer companies or more often government agencies. You know, the armors are sort of a, you know, we want this much armor at this thickness, you know, fit it in this frame in this weight. 
So the real tricky part engineering wise is fitting all of that within uh, something relatively compact and having the mechanical aspects uh, designed so that the vehicle is reliable enough and has enough power to, to have the mobility that it needs. You know, so focus, a book like this that focuses on more the, the mechanical and engineering stuff, I think it's a little more, it gives people an idea of what really is the hardest part in tank design and um, the importance of engines and drivetrains in determining the overall success of a vehicle and even determining what's, you know, even feasible uh, from a design standpoint. So Porsche, with his sort of exotic uh, electric uh, internal combustion combination systems, is uh, he was certainly pushing the envelope in a lot of regards, and there's some real merit to what he was doing, but ultimately it wasn't successful in the context of what Germany needed to win the war. Um, and, of course, as we get beyond the Ferdinands here, we get into some other stuff, some of the more uh, kind of... Panzer 1946 stuff, for lack of a better word, um, these kind of failed things. And then, so this is interesting, some of the, the other engine stuff. So here we have an engine that I've always looked wanted some better information on. Um, the Simmering Graz Parker, or po Poker, P-A-U-K-E-R. This was an air-cooled engine. One thing I found interesting in the books, they talk about how Hitler really had a... Uh, interest in air-cooled engines as the future, which is something that the U.S. Army after the war would also decide was important. So uh, you look at U.S. post-war tank design, engine designs, and they really focused on air-cooled stuff, particularly you know the designs of Continental Motors. Uh, but here we have an air-cooled diesel design. It's a 16-cylinder X configuration. So instead of a V, it's like two, v, two V8s kind of tipped sideways and shoved together to, in a way. So pretty interesting design. Um, Never went to full-scale production, obviously, after the war. The Allies looked at these things. Um, you know, really, after the war, the only country that would pursue air-cooled uh, diesels for tanks is, is Continental Motors in the U.S., um, and they were certainly aware of this engine. Um, in fact, I've got an uh, uh, SAE report written in the 50s by Carl Backley, who's the main, the vice president of engineering at Continental, where he talks about the feasibility of air-cooled engines, uh, air-cooled diesel engines, and he specifically mentions this engine as an example. So I'm not saying that this engine had any actual impact on Continental's designs, but it's one of those things that they looked at and said, hey, you know, we can do this. Because, uh, like I said, it's one of the many examples of air-cooled diesels that he does mention in there. Um, so kind of fun to have that kind of information in there. So here's a little picture of gas turbine in a Tiger, King Tiger tank. So kind of crazy stuff um so that should give people an idea if you're interested in and you know of course we get into the mouse and there's a lot of detail in here I, I'll, I'll admit i have never sat down and read um, all the materials i have on the mouse i've never found it terribly um as interesting as a lot of people partly because uh tanks that don't actually have a combat record i don't find as interesting because uh, there's no context in which to judge them i mean we could sit around all day and argue whether the mouse would have actually been effective or not. I mean, kind of obvious it wouldn't because the thing's ridiculous. But we don't know because it was never put into service. So it, to me, it becomes less interesting. You know, for some people, it might be more interesting because it's a mystery. Like, we don't know. For me, it's more like, well, I can't prove it. So what's the point in thinking about it too much? Anyhow, that should give you a good idea of this book. And that was my somewhat rambling review of it. Uh, I hope people enjoyed it, though. So, again, Professor Porsche's Wars uh, by Carl Ludwig Vigsen. Uh, price, $28.95 in the U.S., which, you know, for a book this size and quality seems pretty reasonable. Uh, obviously available from Pen and Sword. You can get it um, at your better bookstores or online. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this review. I did enjoy this book. It's a nice addition to my collection, and it'll become a nice resource later on in my Tanks of World War II series when I get around to my video on um, the various odd designs of Dr. Porsche. So thank you, and we'll catch you on the next one.